مرزا غالب کا ذکر نہ آئے یہ بھی ناممکن ہے اور آپ سب کے چہروں سے ایسا لگ رہا ہے کہ آپ منتظر ہیں کہ میں آپ کو غالب کے بہت سارے اشعار سناؤں گا میں آپ کی امیدوں پہ پانی پھیرنا نہیں چاہتا لیکن اگر غالب کا کلام سننا ہی ہے تو آپ یوٹیوب پر جا سکتے ہیں بڑی آسانی سے ان سے کہیں بہتر کہنے والے زیاد مہدین صاحب کی آواز میں فریدہ خانم صاحبہ کی آواز میں بہت سارے لوگوں کی آواز میں آپ سن سکتے ہیں میں کچھ اس بہترین کتاب کے کچھ حصے پڑھ کے سنانا چاہتا ہوں کیونکہ کچھ ایسی بہت سارے باتیں ہیں ایک تو میں یہ سب سے پہلے بتا دوں کہ میں اردو کا عالم بلکل نہیں ہوں اور اردو شاعری کا بھی نہیں ہوں مجھے مرزا غالب سمجھا جاتا ہے اس لئے میرا کوئی کسی نہیں ہے اور غالب کا کلام ویسے ہی ہر ایک جانتا ہے ان کے مشہور نظموں یا غزلوں کو پڑھنے کا میرے خیال سے کوئی فائدہ نہیں میں نے سوچا کہ میں آپ کو اس کتاب کے کچھ ایسے حصے پڑھ کے سناؤں جو ایسے شورا کے بارے میں ہیں جن کا میں نام بھی نہیں سنا اور ان کے بارے میں جو کچھ باتیں ہیں تو میں صرف مرزا محمد رفی سودا کے مضمون سے اور حضور شاہد رفی کے مضمون سے کچھ آپ لوگوں کو پڑھ کے سنانا چاہتا ہوں غالب صاحب کی ایک نظم ضرور سناؤں گا جو یقیناً آپ نے کبھی نہیں سنی لیکن اس سے پہلے سہر صاحب کے اس بہترین انٹرڈکشن پیش لبز سے میں کچھ حصے پڑھنا چاہتا ہوں جو کی دلی کی تواریخ اور سترمی اٹھارمی انیسویں صدی میں جو عدد کی حالات تھے وہ کیا تھے ان کے بارے میں ہے تو یہ انٹرڈکشن ہے اس کے بارے میں جس کے کچھ حصے میں آپ کو بہت سنا ہوں یعنی اس چانس The chaotic streets, the unruly traffic and polluted air, the aggressive inhabitants and their hurried life, tolerance for the obnoxious, all these constitute an integral part of this phenomenal city. In beauty resides horror and vice versa. Inextricably intertwined with Delhi's complicated present is her violent history, a history of invasions and assaults, even massacres. It has been late lamented many times through the centuries yet it lives. Each time it was raised to the ground it came back to life with startling vivacity. Nothing dies in death. The ghosts of its past lives roam the streets or bite their time in half-ruined buildings and they rise up to speak in a thousand voices that are still blown about the city. Struggling to breathe under the angry modern facade of the megalopolis is another one time-worn and easily missed, that teems with art, heritage, and poetry. It is the Delhi of Neer and Ghalib, the Delhi of the fabled seven cities, all of which have risen and fallen and risen again, or been changed beyond recognition over time. Delhi's indestructible spirit has haunted writers and poets for generations. Some of them have written out of love, others in awe, and yet others out of bewilderment. In the 18th century, Meer Taqmeer said, Dil o dilli dono agar hai khraab, pa kuch lutf is ujwe ghar mein bhi. In the middle of the 20th century, Percival Sphere compared Delhi with Rome. There are many etymologies that have been offered for the name Delhi, but perhaps one of the most appealing is the philosopher Ram Chandra Gandhi's suggestion that its name could derive from the words Dehri or Dehri, both meaning thresholds. A permanent point of entry and departure, but forever resistant to any stamp of permanence. The city Delhi most resembles is Athens, with its monumental crumbling history strewn all around, its ramshackle seething present. In this seething present, Delhi is bigger, more sprawling than it has ever been. Officially called the National Capital Territory of Delhi, it is the third largest city of India in terms of size, covering an area of approximately 1,500 square kilometers and the second largest in terms of population, home to more than 25 million people. And in the heart of this mega city, in the northeast of its central district, lies Purani Delhi, Old Delhi, where the tale of its glory is ruined and haphazard regeneration is best perceived. It is this walled city of narrow, crowded and cacophonous alleys where it is impossible to walk a few paces or even stand still without touching literally at least ten other people that 
this book is about. Or rather about a few great men of verse who internalized the spirit of this remarkable patch of earth so deeply that they were Delhi and Delhi was them. And together, Rani Delhi and its iconic poets tell a 300 year old story. The story of one of the most evocative languages ever known to humankind, Urdu. It is generally believed that Urdu was born in the army camps of Delhi as a language that borrowed words from different languages so that soldiers from different parts could easily communicate with each other. Those who subscribe to this belief think that since in Turkish the word Urdu refers to an army camp and the language was a product of interaction between soldiers in army camps, it was called Urdu. Noted author and critic Shamsul Rahman Faruqi, however, dismisses this claim. What he writes is, Faruqi Sahab writes, the belief that Urdu originated in Muslim army camps and cantonment bazaars helped generate and sustain two myths. Urdu was the language of the Muslims, and being originally the language of camp and cantonment, it stood in natural need of being refined and gentrified. And the process was initiated by the master poets of Delhi in the second half of the 18th century. Small wonder then that the name Urdu, which didn't come into use for the language before the 1780s, is invariably invoked by our historians to prove that since Urdu means army, army camp, or the market of a camp, the Urdu language was born as a result of foreign Muslims and local Hindus interacting with each other for petty trade and commerce. None struggled to consider that the only foreign armies in India during and from the 1780s were British and some French. There were no Arabic or Persian or Turkish speaking armies in India from the 1780s. And the language of Urdu had by then been in existence for several centuries. Thus, the name Urdu, which first came into use apparently in the 1780s, could not have been given to the language because of the putative army connection. A ghazal is a collection of many couplets, shayr, of the same length and following the same meter. These couplets are thematically autonomous of each other. Sometimes, though a few of them can be read together, indicating a single theme, and when this is done, the cluster of couplets is called qita or qata. Each line of a shayr is called a misra, and the first shayr of a ghazal is called the matla. In the matla, the two lines rhyme with each other, whereas throughout the rest of the ghazal, only the second lines of the shayr rhyme with each other. The last couplet of the ghazal in which the poet's takhallus pseudonym appears as a signature is called the makta. <clears throat> now I'd like to, to, to read to you about Mirza Muhammad Rafi Sauda. In my ignorance of Urdu literature or Urdu poetry, I always assume that Urdu poets have no sense of humor. Ghalib, of course, is an honorable exception. So to discover what the existence of Mirda Muhammad Rafi Sauda, whom Saif Sahib refers to as the great satirist, was a perfect, absolute delight. Sauda was born as Mirza Muhammad Rafi in Delhi in 1713 to Mirza Muhammad Shafi, an Afghan aristocrat who had migrated to India for trade. Sauda lived in Delhi's Kabuli Darwaza area close to what is today known as Naya Bazaar, near Khadi Baudi, which was an upmarket neighborhood back then, inhabited by the city's elite and connoisseurs of art and culture. Those were the times when the domini or courtesan had a distinct place in society. Courtesans were not only trained in music and dance, but also well-versed in poetry and would often receive influential guests for exclusive evening performances. The easiest route to reach the Qila'i Mawlana, the Red Fort, the seat of the Mughal Empire from Kabuli Darwaza was through Chaudhi Bazaar, then an avenue on which stood the elegant mansions of some of Delhi's best-known courtesans. 
Such was the splendor of this avenue that, in, that it inspired the poet Rasif Azima Wadi to compare it to the famed Mount Caucasus of West Asia. Chauri taaf hai ya khurde bani hai Rasif, jambade huro ki pariyo ke pire hai. Sauda originally wrote in Persian for many years. It was at the insistence of a great Persian poet and Urdu scholar of the time, Siraj Sirajuddin Ali Khan Arzu, known to history as Khan Arzu, that he started writing in Urdu. Arzu was the author of two highly regarded Urdu dictionaries and Ustad or teacher to many an aspiring poet, including Mirza Masar Jane Jana and the young Mir Tatimi. Of Khan Arzu, it has been said that his relationship with Urdu literature is equivalent to Aristotle's place in the tradition of philosophy. Unfortunately, none of his verses has been preserved. While Sauda's poetry had started to become popular around 1745 when he was in his early 30s, his fame seems to have reached the Mughal court only after two decades or so. In these two decades, much had changed in Mughal Delhi. Rangila, the great patron of the arts, had died after ruling for 28 years. And after three of his successors came and went in quick succession within 11 years, Shah Alam II ascended to the Mughal throne. In those days, rulers and aristocrats who were fond of poetry and wanted to improve their poetic skills would request established poets or scholars to mend their poems. The Ghazal Banana. Though this meant changing an occasional word to either enhance the musicality or quality of a verse or to correct its meter, it is widely believed that under the cloak of mending, many rich young princes and nobles would actually get their poetry ghost written for a fee. It was a fantastic arrangement. While the broke poet, who could or would do nothing other than composing verse, would not mind the infusion of traditional income, his rich benefactor would earn poetry. Something like our screenplay writers of the industry. In or around 1765, impressed by Sauda's literary prowess, Shah Alam II invited him to the Kilai Morda and sought his help with his poetic skills. Sauda was a no nonsense man. Soon the Emperor's royal demands began to irritate him. It is believed that one morning the Emperor was insisting that Sauda write a particular ghazal for him and Sauda was avoiding the recitation. The emperor finally asked him, Mirza, how many ghazals do you manage to compose every day? Sauda replied, my lord, I managed to compose only three or four verses. To this the emperor condescendingly said, my friend, I compose three or four whole ghazals while I'm in my bathroom every morning. No wonder they smell so bad, said Sauda, <laughs> and came away. There, there is a, a little bit of a, a, a selection of a... Sauda was also a philosopher of sorts. With her unmatched grace and elegance, Zahra Nagar, the celebrated Urdu poet, and one of the greatest connoisseurs of the works of Sauda and Mir, recited a poem to me, in which Sauda beautifully explains how a youngster, anxious to gain quick success, visited a, a wise man, and asked him for Nuskhai Kimiya, the fabled formula for the elixir which infuses eternal life in humans and makes them conquer death. The wise man told the youngster that he would give him the formula, but the elixir would work only on one condition. When asked what that condition was, the wise man replied that the elixir maker should never let the danger of a monkey, Bandar Khatra, cross his mind. This condition, of course, can never be fulfilled. The moment the elixir maker is done with preparing the magical portion and is gleeful and relieved that he did not let the danger or fear of a monkey cross his mind all the while, the thought of that very danger actually enters his mind. And thus, the elixir is rendered ineffective. The point of the story is that if you cannot conquer your fear, no magic. Kaha jaye hai ek mahavas ka haal 
کہ رکھتا تھا نت کیمیا کا خیال یہ سب کر کے دل کے بیچ اپنے قیاس گیا اور ایک مرد کامل کے پاس رہا اس کی خدمت میں وہ چند سال کیا موقع پا کے آخر سوال کہ اگر نسخہ کیمیا یاد ہو تو بندے کو بھی اپنے ارشاد ہو کہا اگر یہی تھا تیرا مدعا تو دیتا ہوں تجھ کو جا اور لا یہ اجزاء ہے اس کے یہ لے کر بنا مگر اس میں ایک شرط ہے درمیان یہ نسخہ تو جس وقت لے کر بنائے کبھو دل میں بندر کا خطرہ نہ لائے کہا اب یہ بات ممکن نہیں جو خطرہ ہو دل میں وہ جائے نہیں نہ سمجھا غرض اس کے رنز و نکات کے پردے میں تھی مرد عارف کی بات کہ اگر دل کو خطرے کے خطرے کے قابو کیا یو پھر ہیچ ہے نسخے کی so memorable by Davenport is not of a notorious criminal or common prisoner, but that of the last Mughal emperor of India, Mirza Abu Zafar Sirajuddin Muhammad Bahadur Shah, an accomplished music composer, a revered Sufi, a distinguished theologian, a great connoisseur of art and poetry, and a poet himself known to the world as Bahadur Shah Zafar. For more than 200 years, Zafar's Timurid ancestors had ruled the larger chunk of South Asia with a splendid and ostentatious display of wealth and authority, authority frequently translated into maximus architectural wonders and peerless artistic marvels. However, after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, the empire had started fragmenting. By the time Zafar inherited the throne in 1837, he was already 62 and frail. Delhi had changed. The territorial limits of the empire barely extended beyond the walls of the Pillar Mohalla, the Red Fort, and the grandeur of the Mughal crown had almost faded away, forcing Zafar to compare it to the beggar's home. Amongst his loyal subjects. 
When the British began the massacre of Delhi to crush, to crush the 1857 mutiny, Zafar was initially unperturbed because his spiritual advisors had persuaded him to believe that no harm could come to an emperor who was protected by jinns. Zafar was well aware that the Mughal throne he had inherited was a sham and the empire mere fiction. Even to travel up to the dargahs at Nizamuddin or Mehrawi from his tila, he had to seek permission of the British resident. As his two decade-long symbolic rule progressed in years passed by, he became more and more distraught by a situation that he could do nothing about. Even age was not on his side. He felt worthless and helpless. The Qila in Morla, despite the collapse of the Mughal Empire and the strange circumstances of the Emperor, frequently laid host to a large number of poets, writers, and artists. These included Hakim Sanaullah Khan Firaq, not to be confused with the famous Firaq Gorakhpuri, who was born decades later, Neer Ghalib Ali Sayyid, not to be confused with Mirza Ghalib, Hafiz Abdul Rahman Khan Ihsan, Qur'an Abdin Khan Zat, Hakim Qudratullah Qasim, his son Mir Izzatullah Ishq, Mia Shakeba, a disciple of Mir Fatih Mir, Mirza Azim Beg, and Mir Amr al-Din Minnat, and his son Mir Nizam al-Din Mahmoud. For an Urdu poet, the greatest honor would be an invitation to recite at the royal Mushayra in the Pila. Like most poets, Zawb II, that was the, the poet laureate, Mr. Ibrahim Zawb, Hazrat Ibrahim Zawb, too had an ardent desire to be associated with the Pila. His friend Bey Karar worked for the royal family and was engaged in the personal staff of Bahadur Shah Zafar, who the then Wali Ahad, heir apparent, or crown prince. On the advice of a few well wishers, Zawb persuaded Bey Karar to introduce him to the Wali Ahad, then 22 years old. Zawb became a regular visitor to the Pila, and the Wali Ahad soon became extremely fond of his poetry. Zafar, however, no, that's a little later. Um, excuse me, I lost There was a there was a section about Ghalib, you see, uh Adu Shah Zafar and uh, Ghalib and Zawb were contemporaries. So there's a very interesting uh, piece on the relationship between uh, Ghalib and Zafar. Anyway, I think we, when I find it, we'll read it later. Zafar, however, was not taken seriously as a poet by his contemporaries. In his list of the 17 greatest Urdu poets of the 19th century Delhi, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan does not name Zafar. It is believed that even Ghalib, who took over as Zafar's Ustad rather late in life, did not consider him a particularly good poet. But Zafar took his poet quite seriously. Soon after becoming emperor, he had appointed as his ustad Sheikh Muhammad Ibrahim Zawb, whose literary rivalry with Ghalib successfully kept the latter out of the Mughal court for long years. Many critics who regard Zafar as a run of the mill poet have alleged that some of his best couplets ascribed to him were actually penned, or at least partly penned, by Zawb, an accusation that seems speculative, if not completely unfounded. Uh, royalty is always loved being eulogized, and Zafar was no different. In 1830, presumably on the recommendation of some of his advisors, he commissioned Mirza Ghalib to write an account of the history of the Mughal Empire in Persian poetry and conferred upon him the titles of Dabirul Mulk and Majmul Bora. A biannual honorarium was fixed for him. Ghalib, who was continuously in debt, would rather have had a monthly remuneration. One day, while in attendance at the royal court, Ghalib, who was aware of the emperor's soft corner for adulatory poets, besieged him in a longish poem to convert his biannual honorarium into a monthly one, holding that the practice of paying someone just twice a year was a slur on Mughal generosity. And this, this was the uh, the Darkhast that Ghalib said, Eh, 
شاه آسما آرن ای جهان دار آفتاب آسار از پری بری مطمئن بار نوکر بھی ہو گیا سب شکر نسبتیں ہو گئیں مشخص جار نہ کہوں آپ سے تو کس سے کہوں مردہ ضروری الازار کچھ خریدا نہیں ہے اب کے سال کچھ بنایا نہیں اب کی بار رات کو آگ اور دن کو دھوپ آڑ میں جائیں جیسے جیل و نمار میری تنخواہ جو مقرر ہے اس کے ملنے کا ہے عجب ہنجار رسم ہے مردے کی چھماہی ایک اور چھماہی ہو سال میں دو بار مجھ کو دیکھو ہوں پتیل حیات بس کی لیتا ہوں ہر مہینے قرض اور رہتی ہے سنت کی تقرار آپ کا بندہ اور پھر نمدہ آپ کا نوکر اور کھاؤں ادھار میری تنخواہ کیجئے ماہ و ماہ تا نہ ہو مجھ کو زندگی دشوار تم سلامت رہو ہزار برس تر برس کے دن ہو پچاس کے ساتھ Islands, 
or to such other place as may be selected by the Governor General in Council. On the 7th of October 1858, Zafar left Delhi for Anubu on a bullock cart, accompanied by his wives, his two surviving sons, and some servants. The family was then incarcerated in a quarter near the Shwe Dagon Pagoda. Records say that the family was provided four rooms of 16 square feet each and four Indian attendees, a peer, a water carrier, a washerman and a sweeper. Zafar was denied pen and ink in paper, but the poet in him was not yet dead. It is believed that the forlorn emperor used a burnt stick to inscribe his last verses on a wall of his room. Left side. Let's check.
Thank you very much, and of course, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.